All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Claire Collery, and I'm the fund manager of Rhinebeck Capital Partners. Thanks for joining our portfolio review. This is where we like to assess the opportunity cost of our current holdings. We like to question what else we could be doing with each one of our assets. I know some people in here like to question what else they could be doing with their time. So we're going to be efficient, 20 minutes. Here's who's in the room. We have our economist, Mark Trainer. We've asked him to provide an update of where we're at in the market. We have Robert Kelly, the asset manager of the River Building, the property that is up for consideration today. We have Mike Weedman from our capital markets team. And we have Matthew Hines and Joe Dembeski from the development side. I'd like to give a quick status update of where we're at in the fund. This is Rhinebeck's fourth fund. It's still early, but so far we're tracking in line with our target returns. We're currently in our investment period, which expires in June. That means we have $200 million left to invest and six months to do it. As far as returning capital to our investors, the fund expires in 2023. We do have two one-year extension options available to us, the first at our discretion and the second at our LPs. We feel comfortable that we'll have the ability to exercise these options if we do decide that we need them to optimize our exit timing. Today, we're going to be doing a hold cell analysis of the River Building. This is a ground-up spec office that we got involved in a few years ago. We're currently finishing up TIs, and the tenants are moving in. It's a great building, 200,000 square feet of Class A office space in a top 25 market, River Valley. We put $38 million of equity into this deal, and we could exit today at an 18% return or a below target 1.4 equity multiple. By the end of this meeting, we need to decide what do we want to do with the river building. Oh, sorry. We need to decide what do we want to do with the river building. We have four options. The first would be to hold the building with the financing that we currently have in place. The second would be to hold the building but to refinance it in order to get some money off the table and juice our returns. The third would be to sell the building and return the proceeds to our investors. And the last option would be to sell the building, but to reinvest the proceeds into another property. We're calling this the pipeline property. This is ground up spec office in Hamilton, 75,000 square feet and shovel ready. It's an opportunity to bring best in class office product to a strong submarket that has not seen new supply come online in 10 years. It's also worth noting that it is the only investment idea that we have that is far enough along for us to pursue before the investment period closes. It feels like we're entering the late stage of the current real estate cycle, which can be a scary time to invest in anything. We're going to need to protect ourselves against a potential downturn, downturn no matter what we do. So I've asked our economist, Mark Trainer, to provide us with an update of what's going on in the market. Once he fills us in, we'll be able to make a more informed decision of what we want to do with the river building. Mark. So I'm going to discuss both the macroeconomic environment and recent office trends. On the economy, I still think we have a bit of room left to run before a likely modest correction. The current economic expansion is approaching 10 years and is now the second longest on record, leading the consensus to believe that we are entering the final innings. But in what type of game? Other developed countries have recently sustained expansions more than double our current length. Expansions do not die of old age. Rather, it's important to assess the underlying fundamentals where GDP growth is accelerating and new job growth remains healthy. There are some significant risks, but there are enough opportunities to sustain the near-term economy. I am concerned that we are approaching full employment, but low prime-age labor force participation rates suggest there are more potential workers out there. Rising global economic uncertainty also presents some concerns but we are somewhat insulated by a large domestic economy. High corporate debt loads and rising interest rates increase market risk, but we think there is still some continued stimulative effects from the recent tax cuts. There is still likely some room to run left in the cycle, but it's important that we are able to execute on our business plans in the short term. I also assess the four previous downturns to understand the range of likely possible situations. It is clear that the 08 downturn was quite anomalous in its severity and that most led to only modest drop-offs in GDP. Most also fully recovered within two years or less. Any future correction is unlikely to match the severity of 08, though it's important that we have flexibility to be able to hold at least two years through an early onset downturn. 
I advise that we pursue deals that can be both quickly executed and with term flexibility to hold through a modest correction. I also assess recent office market trends and think that our properties are well positioned to preserve their value. The office market remains strong with absorption continuing to outpace new deliveries and rising premiums for new construction product, much like those under consideration today. But office still presents a lot of risks and is among the most volatile of the different asset classes. But this volatility is really most pronounced among suburban class B office product, whereas trends of flight to quality will protect our assets. There have been some recent concerns about the need for office space in the future moving forward, but also there have been many trends towards work companies pushing back on work from home options. We think that given the importance of in-person interactions to productivity, that businesses just won't abandon the office altogether. With that being said though, there are trends towards less higher density per employee. Our new construction product is designed to accommodate this density with both shared amenities and open floor plans. Finally, office presents a lot of risk and was hit hard, particularly hard during the previous corrections, but we think the premium standard of our asset will allow us to benefit from flight to quality. Our assets are designed to both protect against, but also take advantage of these recent trends. Thanks for the analysis, Mark. Now let's jump into the river building specifically. Robert, you're the asset manager on this property. What do you think we should do with it? Yeah, well, I'm really happy to report that the river building has been a great success for us so far. As you know, we approach this as a ground up spec development, and it's been a home run. We've not only delivered on budget, but we're ahead of schedule. And in fact, we have five new tenants that are well vetted, moving into 80% of the space. And as this continues to go, this will be a great hit for our fund. But with 40,000 square feet still left to lease, there's still meat on the bone. We are in the heart of a uh, transit oriented CBD with, with good fundamentals, and it continues to grow. Personally, I like to see this building stabilized before we sell it. And to do that, our team has put together an upgraded amenities plan that will keep us best in market, helping us to attract top tenants, but more importantly, protecting our exit cap. I believe this plan falls within Mark's strategy of a quick and flexible uh, execution strategy. Going to your options, I want to focus on that hold strategy for just a moment. So let's table the sell. To understand the hold, we need to look at our debt and how that's going to impact us going forward. So Mike, what have you guys sourced for us? Well, Robert, it's a pretty liquid and borrower-friendly debt market out there right now, and our team got a range of quotes. There's three leading ones, though, that we want to consider in more depth. The first is to extend the current construction financing. Uh, they've agreed to fund 100% of the amenity build-out, as well as all future leasing costs. The other two options we're considering are to refinance the property at its current $109 million value at 65% loan of value and 75% loan of value. In looking at how these options impact our returns, the two refinancings clearly benefit us the most, giving us the greatest returns, and allow us to pull some cash out of the deal today, while also to realizing returns from our remaining equity on, in, the, in the properties on a go-forward basis. It's no surprise the 75% loan of value, the higher leverage deal, gives us the greatest returns. However, as we dig further into the details of these financing options, a clearer picture emerges. First, when we look at extending the existing debt, which gave us a low returns to begin with, they're only going to give us another three years, which somewhat inhibits our flexibility on our exit if we end up wanting to hold the property longer. The higher leverage deal, 75% LTV, has a two-year lockout period. And if we wanted to exit the deal in the next couple of years, if we were ahead of the business plan or got a great offer, that would restrict our ability there. The 65% loan-to-value option gives us five years of additional term, full flexibility, and is also in line with our fund's target leverage ratio of 65%. Part of our success this cycle was that we maintained good lending relationships coming out of the downturn, with minimal loans and workout, and never giving the keys back on any property. As such, the 65% loan to value term here seems to be the best option, and we should continue to stick to that philosophy as we continue to hold the property. Great. Thank you, Mike. So going back to our options, I agree. Option one should come off the table. I don't like that lack of flexibility, and it's subpar returns. And with option two, I like that 65% hold, so let's, let's look at that. But how does that compare to our sell options? Uh, as Claire mentioned, we could sell as is today for an 18% IR, IRR, but we don't hit our 1.6 equity multiple for the fund. However, to really look at these options, we need to look at them on a going forward basis. What are we gonna get from here going forward? If we believe the market were to turn tomorrow, option three where we sell and return our capital to our investors is the safe bet. However, based on Mark's analysis, we don't think that's gonna happen and there's still room to run in this market. So, 
I, I think with, with option two, we can uh, keep our money in the building and get a medium risk return that meets our fund's goals, and for that reason, we take option three off the table. Comparing option three to option four, which is reinvesting in a new project, you can see there's high potential for returns in a new development, but a lot of risk. And we are already meeting our, and exceeding our fund's targets with a medium risk uh, project, so I recommend that we focus on just the hold. So if you come back to our options, I take the sell options off the table, and I'm really focusing on that option two. However, to really understand what option two is going to do for us, and that I want to understand what's happening to interest rates and our exit cap going forward. So Mike, what's your research telling us? It's a great question, Robert. Uh, interest rates are very much on a lot of people's minds in the industry today. Uh, as you can tell, the U.S. 10-year Treasury rate is currently at three and a quarter percent. That's the highest it's been since July 2011 and is a significant departure from the ultra-low interest rate environment that we've been accustomed to operating in of late and when we commenced our investment in the river building. However, it's also important to note that the 25-year average of the U.S. Treasury is 4.5%, so in many ways this is a normalization, but still, we need to take account of it in our underwriting. Because as the old adage goes, as interest rates go up, cap rates go up as well. However, as my team has dug into the numbers, it turns out that interest rate movements really only explains 36% of movements within cap rates. There's a lot of other factors at play, many of which are specific to our properties. The first one I want to highlight is that Class A assets in Class A markets tend to withhold their value greater in interest rate environments relative to B and C product. We're already seeing that happen this year. B and C trades have actually seen expansion in cap rates as interest rates have risen, whereas the Class A market actually saw a slight compression. Also, market fundamentals in the economy, strong economic fundamentals ongoing in the U.S. are occurring, as well as specifically within our submarkets. Strong economic drivers job drive job growth, which drives demand for real estate, which helps support our valuations as well. So while we definitely need to take cap rate sensitivity into account on our underwriting, I think our values will withhold their valuation in most cases. Great. Thank you, Mike. So there are inherent risks with commercial office, but based on the fundamentals that you just touched upon, Mike, and that also Mark talked about, I think this project has the fundamentals to go forward and withstand any sort of downturn that we're going to hit. And looking at our risk-adjusted analysis and, and what our returns might be, we found that the flexibility in the exit cap or the exit timing and that exit cap are going to play the biggest factors in our returns. 